Hello, everybody. Track of the morning to you. Here we are. Track of the day, August. It's loaded my medals in record time. This is, you see the silver here? That's because we played it yesterday on the NLSS. Not as a daily. We didn't take an hour to grind it. So don't hold that silver against me. That's That was a five-minute time. We were top five in BC yesterday. Top 87 in the egg carton. A very solid performance. Today we're on poison. That ghoul is poo. You know that one? Um, <clears throat> the track of the day is now live. I'm looking at the Discord. It's a long track. The gold medal apparently is 48 seconds. The author is 44.546. The Discord is incredible. The finish is a bit Monka S. This map be trippin'. Good map except for Dirt Road. Actually, an easy author medal. Okay, well, let's see. Let's see. GPS? We got, ooh, GPS backward! GPS backward. Okay, okay. Look at that. Okay, you got a, you got a nice jump there. Might want to execute some air brakes. Don't let me tell you how to live your life. Okay, you got a good, uh, good angle on that through the Sidewinder chicane. It's concrete and cherry blossoms. My favorite one-two combo. You're going over the ridge. Shenandoah River. Okay, look at that now. Here, where are you going? Left or right? They've chosen the blue pill. Come over. Oh, that's a that's a little spicy, but I'm interested. Like a like a lamb vindaloo. All right, now oh the dirt ridge. All right, you go up on the luge track. You come down hard. That is a weird way to end the track. And to be honest with you, I am here for it. So I, again, I know this has become kind of what you might consider to be like a recurring uh, theme lately. I got 37 minutes from now until Unity. My, my weeks have been thrown into a tizzy, if you will, by the addition of uh, some Doki Doki Literature Club and also, you know, necessary infant preparations, which you know, I think is fairly understandable. Um, but we're working on it. We got enough time today. We got enough time to do some damage. Right now, I gotta be honest, GPS kind of scared me. Now that I'm actually driving it, I'm like, this seems like a very, at least so far, a very lenient track. No! <laughs> like, it just, it, on some of them, like on uh, Terracotta, the one that I said was the hardest track of the day ever, no clickbait. Um... The GPS was artful, but I think kind of also made it look like um, like it was easier than it actually was, which was definitely, obviously not the case necessarily uh, by definition of the way that I've said it, right? Okay, that one is completely my bad. This one, as of right now, I wouldn't say, because, I mean, we still have not completed the course even one time, um, but I don't really feel comfortable saying that it's uh, easier than it looks, but at least as of right now, it does kind of feel like you just drive the track, you know? You don't have to, at least at the present moment, I don't think you have to put yourself in a position where you're like, hey, remember specifically, at this part, you gotta do this, you know? For now, it's just, uh, just holding it together and trying not to fall between the couch cushions like so many quarters. And I can't think of the last... We were talking about it, I think, on, on Unity last week. It has been a long time, without a doubt, since I used cash. I remember, like, I was at the airport when Kate went to Japan, but I was hanging out at home. And while I was at the airport, you know, sending her off, I was like, I might as well take out a little bit of money. Because I think she needed, I don't know, but look, it was a long time ago. But I took some money out of the ATM. And every time I paid with cash, I was filled with, like... Honestly, it feels like committing a light crime. Like, any time in, in the modern day that I pay with cash, I feel like I'm doing something... Maybe not illegal, but a little spicy, you know what I mean? It's just like, whoa, buying something, but there's no actual record of the transaction except for the receipt? Are you insane? So I was trying to think, like, the last time I held change... It's been a while. It's been a long time. 
I'm not, like, anti-cash, because I, I actually am, like, a, a real boomer at the end of the day. I write checks. I like to receive checks. Makes my accounting... It just fits in with my current accounting workflow, let's put it that way. But uh, cash just doesn't come up that often. I'll be honest, this is a bit of a weird flex. Oh, come on, dude. Let, let's try to ride this one out. It's a bit of a weird flex, but I bet I have used more... Foreign cash than Canadian cash over the past four years. Now, when I say foreign, most of it is just American dollars when we're in Seattle for PAX, but... <laughs> some, some in Japan and some in Korea as well. I mean, I don't see a... I mean, I, I, I could theorycraft some good reasons why you might want to use cash in the modern era. Uh, like perhaps maybe you're uh, purchasing something from a business that, shall we say, is uh, not necessarily, uh, shall we say, strictly legal. And as a result, they're not going to be taking uh, electronic payments because it would uh, perhaps surface their uh, crimes and misdemeanors. But apart from that, I don't know, it's, it's hard for me to come up with a reason to get cash. It just seems like purchasing something with extra steps, you know what I mean? Like, why... If I'm buying a sandwich... Why shouldn't I, uh... Just pay with, uh, my debit card? We want to be left here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, hold on, I gotta focus for a second. Oh, lord. <laughs> I, I kinda screwed it up, but I bet we're still on, uh... Like, heavy silver metal territory. Or gold, that'll work too. Now, this, it was very early. The track's only been live for uh, less than half an hour. <clears throat> so I wouldn't... Tox is back! Let's go! I wouldn't read too much into our top 10 performance is all I'm trying to say. That's not going to be great, I think. Oh, no, it turns out it's completely fine. I do understand, by the way, the value of, like, you know, let, let me put it this way, okay? There's a lot of cash-only businesses, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, spicy stuff. I did see that there was an alternate path there I hadn't even considered. But like, a lot of, like, mom-and-pop restaurants are, uh, are cash-only, and I understand. But I, I don't know. I'm always, like, a little surprised when people uh, are like, you got to support these mom-and-pop businesses but because Visa's taken, like, 1.5% of their gross revenue and I'm like I mean I'm a I'm a small business owner myself if you want to use the legal definition of the term and uh, I, I shouldn't have stopped that one we were actually ahead <laughs> and uh, you know when a, when a company's like hey can we pay you electronically I'm like absolutely not please send me uh, please send me my stipend in the mail instead you know it's uh... so people act like I don't understand but I understand completely but you know you sometimes the cost of doing business. Now, mind you, I will admit, uh, my overhead is a little lower than it is for somebody who owns an actual brick-and-mortar store slash establishment. I'm just saying. Um, but even still, I'm like, I'm happy to, to uh, have done it before, you know. Oh, sorry, you know, we're cash only, but there's an ATM next door. I'll, I'll leave the restaurant, go get the cash. I'm not going to put up a fight about it, but... I'm like... I don't know, it sounds, uh, busted. I'm not trying to, to narc on anybody. I said this before, anytime a restaurant has a sign out front that says, like, cash only, why are they... N oh, my God. Why are they not being audited constantly? Maybe they are, and they're passing the audit just fine. But it just always seems to me like, uh... Somebody, some restaurant has a sign in front of it that's like, sorry, we only accept cash. I'm not necessarily suggesting that they're partaking in tax fraud. All I'm suggesting is that if I were an agent of the Canadian Revenue Agency, I, I might consider um, that to be a warning sign. Dude, I actually thought we were left enough there. Could have fooled me. Whoops. <laughs> but some of the best restaurants are also cash only. Not not best like, oh, are we even going to make it over there? This is a weird one. 
Um, not best like old cuisine. Those are always like, how would you like to pay? Diners Club, American Express, Visa, MasterCard, check, Bitcoin, you know. But uh, we're talking about like a place where you can get a Vietnamese noodle soup for like six fifty Canadian, which is insanely cheap. Well, maybe not insanely cheap, but very cheap by Vancouver standards for sure. They might hit you with the cash only. I do get upset when I go to... Well, upset is maybe a bit of a overarching term here, but I'm always surprised when I go to a cash-only restaurant and uh, the prices are expensive. I'm like, that's not how this works. You're supposed to pass on the savings to the consumer. <laughs> Sorry. We're going we're gonna to focus here in a second. But So I will say I was walking uh, in Vancouver the other day. Had some errands to run. Um, and I saw that there was a food truck. And it was selling Indian food. But it was kind of like a, a fusion type deal. They had a potato sandwich and a paneer sandwich. Paneer is like a, 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 a cheese of Indian cuisine. And I almost got it. But then I was like, first off, I don't need this. Like, I, it wasn't that I was like unsold. But rather it was like, look, I... I you know, I'm probably going to eat lunch when, as soon as I get home anyway, so let's not do this. But I was stunned. The potato sandwich was $3 Canadian, and the paneer sandwich was $3.50. If you don't live in Canada, I mean, I, I can make it uh, Americanized for you. That's like a maybe a $2.50, $2.75 uh, snack or meal, which is like really cheap in 2020. I was losing it. Like I'm, I'm trying to think of what. It's like one third the price of your average Subway sandwich in 2020. I think. Now this is the one. That's the one right there. Remember, you want it. We we read the comments. We want to be a little lower on that than we used to. We cut off 1.6 seconds for a 45.728, which has actually made us worse. But that's okay, to be expected, quite frankly. I don't remember. Wait, hold on. Let me see what we need to get the author medal today. The author medal today. 44.546. Definitely seems relatively doable. So let's focus ourselves, you know, we, Banther has gotten us closer to the author medal than we've gotten for a long time. I do think it's an easy track, so competition is going to be pretty hard, but... So what do we do here? I don't, I don't have the whole track memorized yet. Just keep those wheels straight. Keep them going. Try not to get airtime here. Very gentle diagonal uh, slope. I don't mind that. We'll take the left side, unfortunately, which is going to slow us down when we come over here, but... Uh, the wheels clipping is gonna stop us. Okay, we got it. We got a real chance today though I, I mean, we haven't seen the author medal in a long time I think the secret to you know feeling good about your track mania skill is gonna be getting author medals when they're easy <laughs> When you're only a second off, you know what 15 minutes in 13 minutes in I felt like we've been talking about cash for like 10 years. I Like that letting go in the air there actually seemed like it let me set a more, um, a, a better vector upon landing. So, you know, closer to the slope on the diagonal there. Don't clip your wheels. That's great stuff. You can make this work. You're going to have to turn a little bit. That's okay. No. It's okay. So we still, we kept a lot. We kept a lot. With that turn, we got a lot of work to do. But we saw, we cut off one tenth. <laughs> I actually thought we were gonna cut off like a second. <laughs> we, so we know where we need to improve, and we know where we have improved. I think I think that we got good stuff going. We it would be nice to see how the ghost that passed us did on the final turn. Unfortunately, the ghost that passed us was behind us in advance of that. So you know, by definition, by necessity. It's kind of hard to get it sorted out, I suppose. So you want to stay diagonal and just barely crest over the top. This corner is just a full speed Marty. I had to let go for a second, otherwise we would have clipped the wall. It is what it is. It is what it is. 
Still staying competitive. Now here. Oh, baby. I think I got it. I think I got it. We cut off seven tenths there. I got a smile on my face. I mean, we might as well change opponents again. Keep, keep giving me North America. I'm not ready for the egg carton yet. NA lol. Socks. Socks is up there. If we can beat Socks, we got the author medal sewn up. Show enough. I guess, like, the, the way that I would explain it is I'm pretty sure that uh, the potato sandwich and the paneer sandwich were legitimately cheaper than, like... They were the price I would expect to pay for, like, a donut at a coffee shop. Like, I'm not talking about, like, a Tim Hortons, but I mean, like, you know, a, a kind of bougie coffee shop. Maybe three fifty is a little much for a donut, but... I think you're talking like two fifty, three bucks. I hate even bringing that up because people, whenever you bring up the price of food, people don't come up with reasonable analogs. You know, if you were like, "Oh, I got a, you know, an entire turkey from the grocery store and it was only forty bucks," people would be like, "Forty bucks? Are you insane?" I could buy a kilogram of rice and beans for you know. I, I get it. Don't get me wrong. Different things cost different amounts of money. I'm just saying you got to compare reasonable analogs. Those are not comparables, you know? You're comparing Tim Duncan with uh, David Wallace in terms of basketball acumen there. Now that is how you do it. That is how you do it. We're, we're gonna lose it? Yeah, especially with the airtime. But that was really good up until that point. I think we got this one sewn up. And then you got to think, because I know pe people, uh, and I, I'm not sure if I would call this juvenile or, or needlessly um, pedantic. But I always feel like people always critique things exclusively, uh, like food-wise at least, based on the uh, ingredient cost. Which is, you know, a factor for sure. You also got to think about, you know, like how many, what, what's the raw cost of the ingredients in a, in a paneer sandwich? I don't know, man. Less than $3.50, apparently. But then, uh... You know, the cost of the cart, the cost of the labor to man the cart. You might say, like, uh... Well, it's free labor to man the cart if you man it yourself. Well, it's not really, because you gotta pay yourself a salary in order to survive. Otherwise, why are you operating the, the food cart to begin with? And then, you know, I don't know, maybe there's permit fees you gotta pay. Obviously, you've got to remit the, the sales tax, but then on top of that, you know, you, you pay tax as a business on, on what you're making. I'm like, how is this place making any money on a $3 sandwich? We almost made it in there, too. And I think, like, they might make money on a $3 sandwich if they could get a million orders, but nobody else was at the cart. <laughs> Anyway, maybe maybe next time I give him a, I, I am in the neighborhood, I'll give him a chance. See what's going on there. Because it is it's very interesting. I mean, I want to ask them some business questions. I do think... And this is something, you know, anybody here uh, uh, pretending to be an economist? Anybody here, you know, watch YouTube videos from somebody who's an economist and thus thinks that they're a student of the economy? Um, is there a, a term for pricing something so low that it actually serves like a negative marketing purpose? What I mean by that is, it, it, oh, we're done. <laughs> is there a term for pricing something so low that um, it makes a deal appear to be suspicious? I wouldn't even say too good to be true. But let me put it this way. If you went to a submarine sandwich restaurant, like a Subway, that's not good. Um, and you saw that a, sam a foot-long sandwich was 5 to $7 American, you would be like, that makes sense. If you went to a Subway-type restaurant and a similar size and ingredient sandwich was $1.20, don't get me wrong, you might be like, that's sick. But wouldn't it also trigger something in your brain where you're like, this can't be real. 
that's like half the price of the raw ingredients for this at the grocery store. It would make me think twice, let me put it that way. This is a great run so far. Just hold it, just hold it. You're in a great position here. That's the author medal, ladies and gentlemen. Well done, well done. Just honestly, a very solid race here. <laughs> Still not quite at Sox's level. That's okay. I don't know. I mean, I feel like we can improve for sure just by not um, getting so much airtime on the luge section. There's got to be something like that, though. Because, like, it, it's an interesting phenomenon, right? Because you would expect, and I know how this term sounds, it's a four letter word for a lot of people, and depending on the context used, I agree. But you would expect that, like, you know, if the free market were rational, a cheaper good would have a competitive advantage. At least if a certain level of quality were maintained. Oh, we almost held it, too. But I think that there is probably, like, a sweet spot. I mean, obviously, like... I don't know. I think about this... I'm not a business expert, you know? We, we, in terms of, like, running a traditional business, the only thing we've really done that's in line with that is launch merch. And I, I'll admit, when it came to merch, I had the luxury to essentially... Well, I mean, like, there, there's a lot that goes into considering the pricing, right? We sold our merch for... Yeah, we, you can't air break there. We sold our merch for probably, like, 5 to $20 cheaper than most streamer merch. And I'm not saying that to hate on, uh, you know, any other streamers out there that may have sold their merch for a higher price. But, you know, I think we had $20 t-shirts, maybe $23 t-shirts. I don't know, I should check the store before I say this. And our hoodies were, like, relatively cheap. Like, I think they were, like, 40 or 35 US. I'll admit, I got a little streamer privilege privilege here because I got sent a lot of samples for free. <laughs> I didn't I didn't have to bite the bullet myself on the price, but um, I think if you look at a lot of streamers merch, it's just kind of like, you know, $60 hoodies or something like that, which honestly, like, there, there's, a, there's a place for a $60 hoodie if the quality is good enough. But some of them are just like, you know, I don't mean to hate, it's it's more of like you're buying to support the streamer at that point than buying for like a cool piece of clothing, but... Um, you know, we had the luxury of pricing a little lower for a couple of reasons. One is the way we handled like distribution and, and printing was essentially done in-house. So as a result, we didn't have to pay a, a huge premium to either the, you know, the printer or the, you know, e-commerce site or whatever. So close. And then secondarily, I was also like, people are going to get bent over on shipping. <laughs> so maybe if we can make the, uh, if we can make the uh, price of the units a little lower, that's fine. But in general, it's not always the best, and this is at least my understanding, it's not always the best business practice to price your good at the lowest possible level in order to attract as many consumers as possible, which is why I get annoyed with the indie games. Uh, not indie games, but really the response to indie games sometimes. Where people will be like, you know, oh, this doesn't feel like a $20 game. It seems like a $5 game. And I'm like, yeah, but if they charge $5 for it, you know, they wouldn't be able to uh, live. You know, I mean, there's like a... Because it, it, it's not necessarily fair, because if you make the game cheaper, you're going to sell more copies. But I don't know. Like, I, I, I think that there, there's a sweet spot for everything. Not even in terms of maximizing revenue, but, you know, if a game developer is like, hey, you know, I got to charge... I, we expect to sell 10,000 copies of this. I gotta charge 20 bucks per copy because, you know, Steam gets 30% uh, right off the top, and then, you know, the the government gets another, you know, 17%, and then whatever I take out as salary will get taxed at that effective tax rate. Like, you know, I, I get it. I also don't feel like... Um, I don't think we're in a price-independent world when it comes to indie games. I don't know why I'm talking about this when I could just be driving, but I find it interesting, I guess. Um, I'm not like other guys. I'm a cool guy. 
I like to think about business. But uh, I, I don't think we're in a price-independent world when it comes to indie games. But I do think that the price is less of a factor in whether or not someone purchases it than conventional wisdom would have you believe. I genuinely feel like, and this is again something that's going to ruffle some feathers, I feel like most indie games are either worth purchasing or they're not. Some are too expensive. Like, I'll, I'll hit you with a, a, an obvious example. It's not really an indie game so much. Eh, maybe. It depends on your perspective. Deadly Premonition uh, 2 is a game where I genuinely feel it might be served by being slightly cheaper. Because it is, I think it's 60. It might have even been 80 bucks Canadian, which is 60 US. But, um, come on, you gotta not shoot out like that one. You gotta not shoot out on that one. And I think that a lot more, first off, I think it's more appropriately priced at like, you know, maybe 30 bucks US. Um, and I think a lot of people that are scared off by the fact that, you know, you might love the game, but there's also a reasonable chance you kind of, you know, it doesn't strike you that much. This is not a good start here, but we can maybe try to make it up. Um, would be more interested. But most indie games, you know, when like a an indie game that's interesting, but like, you know, maybe not superlative comes out, and people are like, ah, oh, I wish it was 15 bucks instead of 20, then I might buy it. I'm like, I don't think that's the case. Now, I don't think you should make, take a $20 game and make it 60 I think that's where it maybe becomes more of a factor for, for more people, but... You know, when you're talking about like, oh, this should be $10, this should be $7.50, this should be $15, this should be $25. I think in general, the limiting factor is way less often the price and way more often the quality. I hate to say I love indie games. Um, and, you know, I, I play more of them than like literally anybody I know. Except maybe people that work at indie publishers that are trying to sign games. But even then, um, it, it would be close. Let's put it that way. But most indie games, I'll say it, don't have enough general audience appeal in order to motivate people to buy them regardless of the price. I think there, there's some unicorns there. I think there's some exceptions. Free will motivate people. Five bucks might motivate people. But I think anything that's in that like 10 to $60 range it's way less about the price of the game and way more about the the actual quality of it. There's exceptions to that, I'm sure, but that's that's my hunch after after living in the world today and hearing the slang that the Wu Tangs say. All right, give me a little focus here. We haven't focused for a bit. You want to come up on the diagonal, dude, 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 dude. <laughs> no, we're. I think we can definitely. We're we're probably coming pretty close to the end of the video today. Very rare that we get this kind of, like, semi-serious banter, by the way. It's just, you know, I don't know a lot um, about a lot of things. And my takes on the game industry really rattle people sometimes. But I think that, you know, that's because... Well, you're going to make me say it, aren't you? I feel like, for the most part... I'm not saying that I'm the enlightened centrist in this situation. But I feel like when it comes to, like, games media particularly podcasts there's really only like two archetypes one of them is hey we're the angry middle-aged gamer podcast and i hate everything and this is stupid and blah blue and then the other one is like hey we're the playstation fanboy podcast you know like no matter what happens it, it's like the they got tears in their eyes for teaser reactions and stuff like that and i i want to lest i seem too elitist here I want to say I'm probably way closer to middle-aged I hate everything uh, podcast. <laughs> However, I, I I don't like to go on these bits without casting some uh, aspersions towards myself as well. Um, I feel like I I sometimes it depends. Sometimes I feel like I don't want to speak up when I have a dissenting voice because it's. It's not like you catch a ton of grief for it, but it's just like I don't want to get in arguments about games economics with people who are like... Like, without being rude, sometimes I'll be like, Man, I don't really think like that many people will watch a Northern Lion Tries of an average game and pick it up. 
And people are like, don't get down on yourself. I bought Slay the Spire thanks to you. And I'm like, yeah, it's a 10 out of 10 game. That, that it's, it's beloved, you know? It, like, again, I'm not saying that's a negative comment by any stretch of the imagination. Oh, we made up some time there, too. Oh, not at the end, though. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about stuff that's more like you watch it and you go like, oh, that's interesting. So I feel like I, I actually have like a unique economic take on some of these issues that that is not represented that well by a lot of podcasts that are basically like it's week 75 of talking about ghosts of tsushima or it's you know like you know this company did this fall guys is selling dlc in their game get them you know it's uh and this is like it's weird it's kind of my business it's it's an insanely weird job because i look at myself as like kind of a clown uh, that that really is mostly just designed to entertain people. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a way that's derogatory towards me, to be honest. I, I look at it as a solemn duty. Um, lost a little speed due to friction there. But like the, it's like a weird kind of clown where all of my clownishness has to be tied to one particular digital tech industry. <laughs> So I have, uh, I have thoughts and opinions on it. Don't get air. Don't get air. Okay, we got a little air, but not much. Set a new PB. We can do a little bit better than that, too. But I think our next PB will probably be where I call it. This is a, honestly, I think we could grind this track for an hour. Or like four hours. Like I, I think this is a great track, and we still we got some meat on the bone. The only thing is Unity starts in eight minutes, <laughs> so we're gonna try to we're gonna try to squeeze this one in, and another PB would make me feel pretty sick. Oh, I kind of screwed it. Oh, it definitely screwed it. So I'm realizing, like, all of my time lost um, compared to these ghosts. Like, we're, we're in second, I think. Our PB is in second up here. But uh, all of our time lost happens in the dirt tunnel at the end. So what are we going to do? Quite simple. Kill the Batman. Um, no, we're going we're gonna to try to hold it together. That was obviously bad. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna try to hit the dirt tunnel by going a little bit more to the right. And and I think at this point we pretty much have to take it at full speed, like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, now that we got that locked into the cerebral cortex, we also have to enter the the tunnel uh, a little lower, so that we don't shoot out over the top. And and that's a good piece of advice that came. I forget what the track was. It might have been. Um, no, I don't remember actually what, what the name of the track was, but somebody made like an MS Paint diagram that's like, here's, on, on most of these corners, here's how you want to take them. And it was an incredibly useful piece of feedback that I have thought about many a time since then. You don't want to cut this too much. That's, that's actually perfect right there. That was beautiful. Uh, don't, don't think about it. Just, just get it out of your mind. So anyway, yeah, so this is all essentially one anecdote sprung from the idea of how can you sell a $3 sandwich and make money. It just doesn't make sense to me. Again, because, like, I don't want to, like, mansplain it too much. Because I, I, I don't want to, you know, you're, you're smart folks if you choose to watch this video could be watching a lot of inane nonsense, but instead you're watching a 31-year-old expecting father driving a fast matchbox car. <laughs> You've clearly got great taste, and I appreciate it. Um, hold on. But uh, it, it's just like I, I, you start to run the economics in your head, you know? And you're like, okay, so you're making $3 on the sandwich. The ingredients had to cost you like at least $1.50. Two slices of bread, you know, the potatoes, the spices. Then you got, you know, your your costs in terms of, like, 
you know the labor if the labor has indeed a cost involved you got uh, you know the cost of the cart and all the maintenance and the you know the fryer or the maybe i don't know maybe you just made them at home or you're selling them out of a cooler in the in the cart or something like that it beats me but even still i'm like at most you're making like you know like a dollar maybe a buck 10 in in gross uh profit per transaction and then even then you know it, it gets sliced uh 25 ways before it actually makes its way into your bank account like how you how you're able to survive like that well, you're selling your sandwiches for like you know every time you have a sandwich transaction it ends up being like 25 cents in your pocket the margins they, they seem so necessarily narrow just based on the price of the sandwich in the first place i gotta do an interview with this with this sandwich cart. I'll probably end up seeming like, you know, a ruthless capitalist. They're gonna be like, I retired from my job and uh, I just thought it would be fun to sell sandwiches at cost. Well, you know, that's cool. More power to you. I would love to support a business like that. Especially because I gotta admit, when potato sandwich doesn't sound appetizing, but knowing that it's probably, you know, all spiced up, oh, now we're talking. Oh, we had a chance. Don't bring me down. Next time I should go. But I'll be honest, I'm kind of an anti-food truck guy. I love the idea of food trucks. Um, when I moved to Vancouver, ate at a few in Vancouver, even went to a food truck festival very famous, famously. It was a, a, one of the best anecdotes of 2018 or 2019. I can't remember which one. What was the anecdote? It was quite simple. Um, you know, there's this food truck festival in the city of New Westminster, BC. Um, I dare not say the name of the food truck in question, um, but waited in line for like at least 40 minutes, maybe an hour, to get chicken karage from this karage food truck. Got up to the front, and they were like, sorry, we're out of chicken. All we have left is drinks, like soda. Well, I didn't wait in line for two hours to buy a 7-Up for three fifty. I'm sorry to tell you. Um, but my general inclination... Oh, baby! Let's go! My general inclination about food trucks is that uh, most of the time I find myself being like, this is as expensive as a restaurant that tastes better and I don't have to wait outside. But anyway... Um, top two BC today, Sox. Sox has us beat by a tenth of a second, but we pretty much got to go. Um, author Metal, very nice. Egg Carden, top 23. It's not going to last, but that's okay for now. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you did, please do click the like button. Apart from that, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. See you.